Live from downtown Detroit, Local 4 News at 11 starts now. Airport attack. Second floor inside the terminal, we got an officer down. A Flint officer stabbed in what's being called by the FBI an act of terrorism. Suffice it to say, uh, he, he has a hatred for the United States. Tonight, the Canadian man charged in the attack has appeared before a judge while the officer remains in stable condition. Glad you're with us tonight at 11. The suspect in this case is 50-year-old Amar Fatoui, and federal agents do have him in custody. Fatoui holds dual citizenship in Canada and Tunisia. Tonight, police searched his apartment in Montreal, and the feds filed a criminal complaint detailing what happened at the airport. According to federal documents, Fatoui shouted in Arabic, Allah is the greatest as he was stabbing Lieutenant Jeff Neville from behind. Local 4 is live in Flint tonight. Jermont Terry at Bishop International Airport, but we'll begin with Mar McDonald at the Federal Courthouse, where Fatui apparently spit at a guard before his hearing got underway, Mara. Devin, he sure did, which is why he spent part of his hearing in the federal courthouse with a mask on. And it also turns out that Mr. Fatui does not have the resources to afford an attorney, so he will have a court appointed one. The complaint that's been filed is charging uh, a violation of 18 U.S. Code 37A1. And tonight, 50-year-old Amor Fatui has already had his initial appearance in Flint Federal Court. Fatui entered the U.S. legally from Canada. He lives in Montreal through New York State on June 16th and made his way to Flint. Why Flint is unclear tonight, but Fatui came to the Bishop International Airport around 9 a.m. with two bags. Per the federal criminal complaint, a red duffel and a dark satchel. He went up the escalator to the second level, went into the restaurant, and then... He uh, spent a little time in the restroom, uh, dropped both bags and came out, uh, pulled out a knife, uh, yelled Allah Akbar, and stabbed Lieutenant Navelle in the neck. According to the feds, it didn't stop there. Fatui continued to yell Allah several times, and that said something similar to, quote, you have killed people in Syria, Iraq, and Afghanistan, and we are all going to die. Now, a law enforcement officer nearby saw it all happen and was able to get Fatui before he could harm more than Lieutenant Neville. And Fatui, quote, asked the officer why he did not kill him. The feds also detail the weapon Fatui used, described as an Amazon jungle survival knife. Back here live, you look at that knife, you can see it's a big one and it has a very uh, sharp serrated blade. He attacked Lieutenant Neville from the back and in the neck. Lieutenant Neville is in the hospital tonight, but we are told in stable condition. Now, as far as Mr. Fatui's motivations and what ultimately led him to Flint, Let's get right to my colleague, Jermont Terry. He's live at Flint International Airport tonight. Jermont. Mara, the man police say came here to Bishop International Airport, walked in, but he left in police custody upset because he did not die when officers arrested him. As you mentioned, we have learned that Fatui is a father to several children. But right now, tonight, investigators cannot say with certainty why he traveled so many miles to, travel, to carry out this attack here in Flint. Amor Fatui is from Montreal. Soon after police identified Fatui as the attacker, the FBI quickly contacted Canadian officials. They surrounded Fatui's apartment. Canadian officers went inside the unit, hoping to discover why he chose Flint, Michigan, and if he did anything suspicious along the way. Court records revealed last Friday Fatui left Canada, crossing into the United States by entering New York State from Quebec, then traveled close to 500 miles through Pennsylvania and Ohio before parking at at Flint's airport. It's a more than 10 hour drive and investigators are trying to determine what, if any stops he made along the way and whether he met anyone as he traveled to Michigan or did he act alone. Back in Montreal, neighbors were shocked to learn the man who lived next to them for six years in their community was suspected of this act of terrorism. Published reports show Fatui talked to few people and kept to himself. They were aware he was a father of several children. What Canadian investigators found in this apartment is unclear, but they are making it very clear the joint agency probe is headed by the FBI. As, as soon as uh, uh, an, an incident like this happens on either side of the border, the, uh, the, the communication back and forth is instantaneous uh, and it, uh, it functions in both ways. 
So tonight, a lot of questions remaining, but we should point out that the airport here in Flint was shut down for a good portion of today of the day. You can see tonight it is back open and it's unclear right now if there's been any extra security added in light of what took place here today. For now, reporting live in Flint at the Bishop International Airport, Jermont Terry, Local 4. Yeah, all right, Jermont. Well, tonight, the U.S. Attorney General Jeff Sessions released a statement on the stabbing. And that statement reads in part, President Trump has prioritized the safety of all law enforcement officers, and this Department of Justice is committed to that goal. I want to assure all our law enforcement across the nation, any attack on someone who serves and protects our citizens will be investigated and prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law. I am proud of the swift response from the FBI and our federal prosecutors and their partnership with local police and the Canadian authorities. Now, after the attack, we spoke with the former FBI chief in Detroit, Andy Arena, explaining why this type of attack is so hard to defend. You're talking about soft targets. And, and an airport, obviously, is a hardened target, but how far out do you push the, the, uh, the, the lines of defense? So, uh, you know, we've seen attacks at uh, baggage claim areas. Um, you know, ticket counters uh, in front of the airport. So how far out do you push uh, the, the, the limits here? This, this is almost an undefensible position. Now, there was no one else uh, wounded or injured in today's attack. We also spoke with Detroit Police Chief James Craig about how police respond to these kinds of things. You can listen uh, to his comments and also read the other statements that have been made on it. It's all on the homepage of clickondetroit.com. All right, well, the local forecasters are tracking a severe weather threat for tomorrow. I'm here with Ben now with a look at uh, what we're expecting and, and when. We're going full on summer tomorrow. <laughs> uh, temperatures, humidity, storms. Everything. The whole night. So forget about today, which was a great, beautiful, perfect really day. Was. <laughs> Just kind of eased us into it. But I'll tell you, once we get into the afternoon hours, especially, that's when we got to start watching the skies for those severe thunderstorms. Parts of the area, especially our west and south zones, are in that slight risk for severe weather. That's category two. A little bit lower threat, the marginal risk. That's category one uh, for the remainder of the area. And again, we're really focused on the late afternoon and early evening hours. Still going to be a wet commute. There'll be some scattered showers to get started tomorrow morning. We'll watch for those scattered strong storms in the afternoon and then could see another round as we get into Friday morning. So as you get started tomorrow morning, make sure you tune in to local four news today. First thing to get weather and traffic on the four starting at 430. Guys. All right, Ben. Police open fire on a neighborhood on Detroit's west side after a man pulls a gun on them. They approached the man as he walked near Schoolcraft in Woodmont, but the man ran off. During the chase, he pulled a gun and pointed it at officers. They fired shots at the man, but he was not hit. The man was arrested and will face a list of charges. Two 14-year-olds are in critical condition after this deadly head-on crash in Sterling Heights. Police say the driver of that gold Buick lost control while try trying to pass another car and slammed head-on into a minivan. The driver of the Buick was killed. The two teenage passengers critically injured. All three are from Roseville. The two people from the van are in stable condition. A day-long dig by the feds on Detroit's east side turns up nothing. The feds were searching for missing persons at a home on Dickerson near Mack. Agents were responding to a tip that had come in. The search was for two bodies from two different cases. That home, by the way, is owned by the Detroit Land Bank Authority. Tonight, we're hearing from family members of the three-year-old boy who accidentally shot and killed himself while holding a gun he found on the ground. Cameron Dillard was playing outside his Clinton Township apartment complex with other children when someone walking by dropped a gun, as improbable as that sounds. The kids thought it was a toy. Dillard picked it up, and it went off. It was a very amazing, extra busy, lovable three-year-old. Tonight, family and friends held a vigil in Cam's honor. Police did arrest the 29-year-old man who they say dropped the gun. He, in fact, was already on parole for a weapons charge. Two mothers are now charged in connection to the female genital mutilation case. The feds say the women are from Oakland County and brought female relatives to Detroit to undergo the procedure. They joined the doctor accused of performing the mutilation, the clinic owner and his wife and another person who investigators say was present for the procedures. The mothers pleaded not guilty in federal court and are now on home detention.
Detroit's EMT workers are about to see a boost in their pay. Uh, today, Mayor Duggan announced the EMS union has ratified a new contract. Under the new deal, all EMTs and paramedics will get a 4% pay raise with the ability to earn annual bonuses as well. It's a new contract that will run through June of 2020. A warning for parents tonight, the popular car seat with a dangerous defect will tell you what to watch for. A runaway bus causes panic on the streets, what the driver did moments before that sent the bus rolling. But first, so many products that claim to do the job, but which ones really keep bugs away? Help me Hank and Dr. McGeorge team up to bring you the best ones to protect your family from itchy bites. All right, welcome back. Before you head out for your next bonfire or walk in the park, whatever it may be, you may want to take a look at the bug spray you plan to use. Our consumer investigator Hank Winchester teamed up with Local 4's Dr. Frank McGeorge to show us which bug sprays are the most effective at keeping the pesky and dangerous sometimes mosquitoes away. Uh, we know a lot of you are going to be spending time outdoors. Obviously, the weather's getting a lot nicer mm -hmm. and people want to stay safe and they don't want to be irritated by mm -hmm. bugs and ticks. So. Mm -hmm. We're here with Dr. McGeorge to kind of go through some of the products, things that work and things that don't. What should you be looking for, general mosquito protection? Well, the best product out there is something that will contain DEET. DEET is really something that covers a variety of different insects, ticks, mosquitoes in particular. There's an optimal level of DEET, so between 30 and 50%, that's where you're gonna kind of get the best protection in terms of duration of action. We looked at a number of different products rated by Consumer Reports, which found these to be the best when it comes to DEET and Picardin. Picardin is as effective as DEET, but less greasy and also safer for children. You look at some of these products and, and the cans make it all sound great. They also claim they can do a lot of different things, including uh, not only prevent uh, mosquitoes from hanging around, but also work with sunscreen. Are those, is that a good idea to buy an all-in-one like that? Well, okay, so the all-in-one products with sunscreen and insect repellent are not a good idea at all because you apply sunscreen at a different frequency than you apply insect repellent. But when it comes to the store brands, can you buy a bug spray that's a little bit more affordable and still very effective? 10% DEET is 10% DEET. So if you get 10% DEET in a generic formulation, Compared to the brand name formulation, it's still 10% deep. You have to check the ingredients to be sure you're getting protected. These products were rated the lowest on the list with the lowest level of deep or Picardin. Beyond the sprays there are also different products like citronella candles or these off sticks that you can buy. Yeah. You don't look like you love them. <laughs> no, you know, none of those are gonna really protect you. While they might keep some insects away, they're not gonna be any kind of direct protection. So those are just a few tips to keep you and your family safe. We have more information on the Good Health page and also the Help Me Hank page at clickondetroit.com. I'm Hank Winchester. And I'm Dr. Frank McGeorge. Back to you. Good reminders. It is, but it's tough because some of it really does seem so toxic. It really does. You know, which is worse. It on. Than, yeah, 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 I know. Putting it on sometimes. All right, here's a look at what Karen Drew is working on for tomorrow night. It was like the scariest moment I have ever had. A mistake that put her child's life in jeopardy. Complete panic, like my heart stopped. I just ran out to the car. Getting in the car, going about her day, like many with children do. You are responsible for your actions. Take your children with you um, is my best advice. I'm Karen Drew, a mother's life-saving lesson, tomorrow at 11. Well, I, we do have hotter weather coming, but I was just, it, it made me feel a little better to know that it's not 120 like it's been oh, in my Phoenix goodness. out Don't west. Oh my feel for those folks out wow. there. Wow. <laughs> weather schadenfreude, right? <laughs> it's, all, it's always nice it's to see it somewhere else. else. Uh, yeah, one and done for us on the 90s, uh, and that is tomorrow, but it is going to be a scorcher in spots. Uh, let's start out with the uh, satellite radar tonight. We uh, saw some of those clouds form in the afternoon, uh, but a lot of those cleared out, and so temperatures dropped pretty quickly. We're going to see a few more of these clouds start moving in as we start looking for our first chance of rain, which is going to be around the morning commute tomorrow. By the way, look at the edge of the clouds from Tropical Storm Cindy all the way north of Indianapolis right now, and that storm has still not made landfall. Should be uh, coming on shore somewhere here between the uh, Louisiana and Texas border in the just about the next couple hours. Sustained winds are at 50 miles an hour, so this will come on shore 
as a tropical storm. Winds are not going to be the problem. It is going to be rain. They've already had over six inches of rain in parts of Louisiana. And as this storm continues to arc back to the northeast, it uh, should rain itself out here by Friday, at least as far as a tropical storm goes. Still going to be some rain hanging around as it merges with the front uh, south of us going into the upcoming weekend. So as far as what we're expecting for tonight, those uh, temperatures are at 67 right now. That southeast wind is six miles an hour. Nowhere near as chilly as it got this morning in parts of our north zone. This is from Storm Pins in Ray, Michigan. KD says, what is that? 46. She says, got to be a record. Unfortunately, it's not 42 is the record and that's all the way down at Metro Airport. So didn't quite get there, but we will be seeing milder temperatures tonight and you'll see that chance of showers start moving in here as we head towards seven, eight o'clock in the morning. Uh, this new run of the model doesn't have a whole lot in the way of moisture as far as the morning goes. And even in the afternoon and evening, it's kind of pared back on the coverage of these thunderstorms, not necessarily the intensity. So anything that does pop up has the potential to become severe as we get into Friday morning. We'll see another round of showers, maybe a thunderstorm. And as a cold front crosses, it almost gets everything out of here by the afternoon. May see some east side showers as we head towards lunch, but the majority of Friday is looking dry. 62 tonight with mostly clear skies and our high temperatures tomorrow. Who going to be sweating it out before those storms get here? High temperatures, low 90s across most of our metro zone. South zone temperatures will be in the 90s as well. And because of the humidity starting to spike too, we're going to see those heat index readings likely in the mid 90s. Uh, but the rain going to have just a little bit of an earlier impact in some parts of our west and north zone. So 80s for highs there and maybe even a couple 70s. Up here in Lexington could be seeing 79 for highs tomorrow afternoon. But the 90s go away quickly. In fact, the 70s come back for the weekend and into early next week, so a very comfortable forecast for the majority of that time. Yeah. We do have some rain chances uh, Sunday afternoon and a the yes. fortunately Monday. N notably, <laughs> yes. We'll see if we can do something about That'd that. That'd be good. Yeah, right. Thanks, Ben. Two big home improvement stores are being accused of deceiving customers. What some buyers say just didn't add up. Also, an out of control city bus flying down the streets of New York. What the driver of the bus didn't do that caused panic when we come back.